So if we look at the final exam schedule, which I'll have on screen as soon as the projector warms up and shows it to you, Tuesday's Thursday classes at 5.40 are supposed to meet for a final on Thursday, December 12th. If you do your project, you don't have to do it then. So, in that case, that Tuesday would be our last period of class. So we will have class today, and on Thursday, and on the 10th. So the 10th is going to be the last day of class, and if you you better have your project done by the 12th. If you don't, then come in and take the final. Although realistically, you could take the final at the library all the way up to the last day, which is the 18th. Believe that to be true there. Okay, the 17th. So let's make a notice to that effect. So the last day of class is December 10th. If you're going to take the final, come December 12th, or take it at the library up through December 17th is, I think, what we saw. Yes. All right. For those of you all who are taking the online version of the class, coming here, just in taking it in class would probably not be a good idea, so you're going to take it at the library using ProctorU. So you won't see quite the same announcement. So opening up our PowerPoint for scripting. Is JavaScript. Oh, come on, go away. It's a programming language designed for web pages. Really, what it does is when you ask for a document or when your when your browser requests a document, the browser connects to a web server. The web server reads something from either its a directory, you know, using file access, or it calls some kind of program that'll generate a series of bytes of text to send back to you, like the HTML that we created last time. And then the browser turns that text into a memory model that, you know, so that it can then display that stuff on screen. And that memory model is called the document object model. And so what JavaScript does is it modifies the document object model so that you can hide things, you can insert things, you can change the color of things, you can create pop down lists. Right, so it's all interacting with the document object model which is built when the HTML is read by the browser. Why do we use it? It enhances web pages with dynamic and interactive features. If there's a way to even turn off JavaScript anymore, which I'm not sure there is, um, I mean, yeah, I guess it may be. Nobody does it anymore. Forget it, I'm not going to find it. But if you could disable JavaScript and you went to something complicated like eBay or Amazon or something like that, it would look like total garbage. Um, the functionality would be extremely limited because JavaScript nowadays is kind of like the underlying thing that makes all of, our, all of our web pages interactive, really look nice, give you a lot of extra functionality rather than just being a straight page with some links and some buttons on it, which is what they look like in 1995. It runs in the client, meaning it runs on your browser. The server just serves it up as part of the HTML text file. So the server's not doing anything special. When you're interacting with, what was that? Like if we're on eBay, or we're on Amazon, we're on something, some cool site, some JavaScript heavy site. 
and I'm moving my mouse around. It's not accessing the server in order to be able to do this stuff. Because any access to the server, once you see the little spinning wheel, can take a long time. If your internet connection is spotty or whatever, then that can be spinning that wheel for a long time and then it can say, you know, server timed out or whatever. So the more that can be done on the client side, and that's what the JavaScript is doing, the better. So that if you can be building lists and displaying drop down menus and stuff like that without accessing data from the server, then your program is going to run a lot more smoothly for the user. So it's important that it's a client side programming language. Well, that implies that there's a server-side programming language, too. There's a whole bunch of server-side programming languages. You can use C Sharp, JavaScript, all sorts of different programming languages that can hook in to a Java, excuse me, a web server. And then when you make a request to that web server, it calls that program, and that program creates the HTML, rather than just reading it from a file like we were doing on Tuesday. You know, programmatically, it can create it. And so you can be absolutely mm -hmm. sure that when you're using Amazon and you click on something, it's just not opening a .html file or a .txt file and serving it up. Instead, it's calling databases and building lists and things like that from the databases. And then when you type in a search function, right, it does that again. It hits the databases, builds all of the file together. You know, like, let's say I'm looking for R2-D2. Once I do that, I get a whole bunch of these guys. I could right-click and do view page source and I'd see everything that the server-side software generated. Bunch of gobbledygook. Whole bunch of JavaScript. Whole bunch of JavaScript. All right. So it runs in the client. What we're going to do on Thursday is we're going to run Python as a web server. So we're going to actually do server-side programming. Right now, all of our Python has been client-side programming, right? Because we're sitting there, we're on the client machine, we run the program. But although you would not use Python as your web server, that, that'd be a ludicrous idea, it can demonstrate the idea of server-side programming. So we're going to write Python programs that generate web pages. You will run your browser side-by-side -side with Python, and the browser will make requests to Python. Python will generate the text document to send back to the browser, which will display a nice, pretty picture, you know, interactive web page. So, like I said, you want to avoid doing stuff on the server, so common JavaScript tasks replace server-side scripting. Enable shopping carts, form validation, like if they type in a phone number but they don't put in enough digits, you don't want to wait until they click the OK button and then it has to make you know a round trip of accessing the server and getting the data back and that could take you know two to ten seconds depending on your cell phone connection or whatever. So form validation, it's better if you know it tells you right away you try to type in something and you click the OK button without having to hit the server. Much client side stuff as you can do. Unlike HTML, client JavaScript is case sensitive. Now I am going to be typing the examples in here. A lot of the examples, I think maybe we can just copy and paste out of this PowerPoint. If we get it wrong and I come and look at your screen and we can't fix it like within a minute, then we're just going to have to shrug our shoulders and say, I'm sorry, we can't get it working. Because it is so picky. The syntax is so picky. And unlike Python, there's no syntax checker involved. What do I mean by that? When we're using TextPad and then we try to load it, it doesn't you know, jump to the syntax error. So it makes it really hard to figure out what the problems are. So objects refer to the windows, the documents, the images on the screen, the forms, the buttons, etc. When you create an object, like a button, it should be named in the HTML so that the JavaScript can interact with it. We will get some examples of that pretty soon. Properties are object attributes. So object properties are defined by using the object's name, a period, and the property name. So if we want to get a hold of the background color of the web page, the object is called document. Remember when I called it the document object model? And then a dot, mm -hmm. and then followed by BG color. Mm -hmm. Kind of like when we were using turtle.forward and you know stuff like that. So document is the object, BG color is the property. And then methods are the same thing as functions. They're just called methods here. Document.write will display something. It'll write it to the screen. It'll write it to the, doc, um, to the document object model so it can be displayed on screen. 
So we would think of it as a function, but it's a method. A method is an object-oriented programming term. A method is a function that's attached to an object. And then there are events. Events are triggered by the mouse moving over the screen, or the finger clicking on things on a touch screen. When my mouse moves over something and it lights up, that's because the JavaScript is handling the on mouse over event. So it's called event triggered programming. You know, you click on a button and then something happens. You move your mouse over something and then that happens. And so the functions are named statements that perform tasks that aren't attached to objects, which is what we've been doing most of the time. Like do whatever is a function. You got to put curly braces. We're not going to use tabs to format our text. We're going to use curly braces instead. You can also use tabs, but it's not mandatory. And then you have values. Numbers can be values. Strings are stuff enclosed in quotes. You can have the word true or false, lowercase rather than uppercase, as in Python. You can have images, and you can have form, excuse me, functions. When you want to create a variable, you don't just say month equals something. You have to stick the VAR keyword in front of it. That creates a variable. It tells JavaScript that the thing following that keyword is a variable declaration. So you could create a variable without giving it a value, which is something you cannot do in Python. You can't create a variable without a value because the act of giving it a value defines the variable. Mm -hmm. But here, you give it that keyword, VAR, and you give it a variable name, and now that variable exists. Operators, we know what operators are. Plus, signs, equals for comparison, although I can guarantee it's going to be equals, equals. Just set. And then log logical operators like and, and then control operators like if. Yes, sir. Uh, back to the variable. Uh huh. Is there a way, I mean, does, does it automatically know what kind of variable you're setting? Like the, the type of variable, like whether it's an integer or character? It's like Python, whereas if you assign it a string, it's a string all of a sudden. And if, it, if you assign it an int, it's an int all of a sudden. It's not like C++ or Java where you say this is an int and that's all that can be stored in that variable. So very good question. In some languages, you declare the data type. You say month is a string, and then all you can store in it are strings. So if you turned around and you typed in a number there, then it would generate an error. So JavaScript can reside right inside the HTML file, or it can be stored in a separate page, which is linked to your file. The JavaScript can actually be attached to the elements of your web page. Let's see if we can get that going real fast, just off the fly, or on the fly. I'm going to create a brand new web page using TextPad. It's going to be the world's simplest web page, because I'm making it up on the fly. TextPad. What do we know it needs to be? Well, I'm going to do a save as, and the type of it is going to be an HTML document. Looks like we're on lecture W, so we're on lecture X, X now. Lecture X.html. So I'm going to do HTML, closed in uh, angle bra braces. We're going to have a header but I'm not going to put anything in the header. I'm just pretty sure I'll need it later. I'm not sticking anything in the header right now, so I'm just going to close that tag. That's the forward slash, so one other question mark, not the backslash. And then a body. And then a paragraph with just the word text. And I'm going to close my paragraph. So angle slash P angle. I'm going to close the body. Angle slash body angle. And I'm going to close the whole page. Angle slash HTML angle. And I'm going to save my document so the asterisk goes away. Because if I tried to view it right now, it wouldn't be able to view it until the file is saved. So I like hitting Control S, but the floppy drive over here does the same thing. And then I click the little world. And it views it. OK, text. That's all it is. 
what if I wanted to make something so that when you did on mouse over, I'm not going to wing it, I'm just going to, uh, we'll, we'll follow the examples in the page. But we could do this. Let's go ahead and do this part. Let's do the on load, notice a capital L, equals alert parentheses quote end message end quote. Notice the usage of a double quote here and a single quote there. That's just to differentiate. They can be used interchangeably, but you, you better be real careful, like if you put a single quote there, that you had double quotes here. Can I type? There we go, like that, double quotes around that. And of course, if you copy and paste from the PowerPoint and it has these dumb back apostrophes and forward apostrophes and back quotes and forward quotes, it's not going to work. So we're going to add an onload property. And we're going to set it equal to a JavaScript command, a call to the alert function. So over here, inside body, body space on load with a capital L. When it loads, what are we going to do? So equal double quote, alert, parentheses, single quote, hello, exclamation mark, in single quote or apostrophe, in parentheses in double quote and it'd be nice to put a semicolon there even if the example doesn't show it. So when I view it I should see that message pop up on the screen. One of the worst things you have in your web browsing experience is pop-up messages. There it goes. Hello! And then it views the rest of the text. That was by putting a property that was attached to onload. We were calling these tags and we were calling these attribute attributes. So it's really an attribute. The onload attribute is setting up the onload event handler so that as soon as it's loaded it calls this JavaScript function. Anybody need typo assistance? All right. How do, you, how do you run the program? I saved it with the floppy drive and then I clicked the planet. And as long as you saved as HTML, that'll launch your browser. Can you go back to the screen real quick? Yeah. All right, so if we were going to write scripts, would we want to write 20 lines of code that was tucked away inside an onload function? No, we'd want to write a function. And the functions would be defined in a script block inside the header, or you could write the functions inside a separate file, which is what the next slide is going to be talking about. So you can link to files that are in other files. When it says .js, there's nothing magical about it. That's just a text file. Just like a Python file is a .py file, but it's just a text file. So if we wanted to store our scripts in a separate file, which I'm not going to, then we could create an under file called you know, myjavascript.js or whatever we wanted to call it. And inside our HTML, inside the header, we would have a tag that loaded it up. So when specifying a script, only the tags script and slash script are essential. But complete specification is recommended. All we really need, and all I'm going to be doing when we do our own examples, is that much. But you could tack on the rest of it to be more correct. But honestly, it'll work just as well without it. But if you run it through a web validator, you know, it'll complain that you didn't specify what language the script was in. But I think the only language that these things support is JavaScript, so it's kind of silly to specify. But they made it flexible so that later on, if somebody does invent another scripting language that works with the document object model, you can specify it. And then the script itself is prefixed by this absurd looking little symbol here. Angle, exclamation mark, dash, dash. That's because that's an HTML comment. If you stick something in your document with that, then it is commented out just like we'd use the hash sign. And so they hide the scripts inside HTML comments, but
But so old browsers that didn't know what JavaScript were would still be able to display it. Now you're not going to be able to find any machines anymore that don't know what JavaScript is, but I guess in case you turned on your Windows 3.1 machine and managed to access the internet with it, it it's it's still good a good programming advice, you know, for backwards compatibility to do that. Let's demonstrate a comment. So I'm going to go back over here. If we look, it begins with the angle and an exclamation mark and it ends just with the angle. So angle or less than exclamation mark dash dash now if we put some kind of text here slash p in slash wow close that p tag so less than slash p in slash and then we're going to close our comment like that this is now commented out if it didn't if it wasn't prefixed by this stuff then it would actually show in my page when I saved it and ran it. But it's commented out so we don't see that anywhere. Now I am going to remove it but I don't want you to follow along because I'm going to quickly do undo. You know if I remove the comment out characters notice the comment out characters go before and after not just before like we can do with single line comments in Python. Right there it is. But I'm going to undo that because I just want to show that this that's a comment. So you can use comment tags to break apart. However, if you're adding comments to your JavaScript, you use slash slash. That replaces the pound sign we use in Python. So we're wrestling with two different concepts here. This is an HTML comment. And you stick your JavaScript inside HTML comments. And the JavaScript comment is slash slash. We'll see some examples of that. So event handlers, like on mouse over, are a perfect example of an easy to add tag script. So when we move our mouse over something, we can make it do something. Like we could create an ahref that when they move their mouse over, changes it to something, changes the image to something else. Now I'm going to wait until we get a better example of that. But maybe we could just change document.bg color. I think we saw an example of that, right? Way up early. Document.bg color. Let's add an on mouse over event to our paragraph of text and see if we could make that text when our cursor goes over it change the background color of the document. So I'm going to come in here on my text tag on is it a capital M? I need to get it exactly right. Capital M but the rest is all lowercase including the word over. Okay, absolutely sure that's correct. Yep. All right. So on P on capital M mouse over equals and we're going to type in a line of JavaScript. It could just be another alert message. That would be really annoying if something popped up just as soon as you moved your mouse around. So alert, parentheses, single quote, wow. End, single quote, end parentheses, semicolon, end double quote, and close brace, like that. So now when I move my mouse over this paragraph of text, it's going to pop up a pop-up alert. Right? So when I come and move my mouse over here, it popped it up. It triggered the on mouse over event was triggered. And what was on mouse over supposed to do? Oh great. I hope I can get rid of that. There. All right. So that was a bad idea. Let's let's do something else with it. Document. Document. Dot bg color all lowercase equals quote silver end quote. Now I used double quotes and that was incorrect because double quotes are here. 
So I'm going to change these inner quotes to apostrophes, just so I don't confuse it. So apostrophe silver in apostrophe. Now when I run it, it should change the background color. So floppy disk, move that. And it's not, but I'm not going to spend too much time trying to figure out why. Maybe I didn't pick a good color name, you know, I'm not going to bother figuring it out. So for now, I'm just going to delete all of that until I get a better idea. So I just have on mouse over is equal to quote quote. So we've already done on load, so I'm not going to do this demonstration. JavaScript functions go in the script section in the header of the document, while HTML tags go in the body of the document. We will have an example of that real soon. We can put script and then a closed script inside head. We forgot our title this time. Maybe we'll add our title while we're at it. So inside the head tag, less than, title, greater than, I'm just going to say CIT1203, and then less than slash title, greater than, and then script inside the angle braces, and then less than slash script. This is where we can put our JavaScript functions. And as mentioned on a prior slide, we could hide our functions inside of a comment tag. We could put a comment tag right there. I'm not going to do that because it makes it harder to read unless the example shows that. I do not think that it does. All right. So what are we going to do? Our script is going to be, our function is going to be called change demo. Although that's an awful lot of text, so maybe I'll just call it change. And it does this method, get element by ID demo, stores it in E, and then it sets the inner HTML of that element and makes it say, hello, JavaScript. So to get this to work, get element by ID. If we look at the HTML, there's an ID for that paragraph called demo. So when it calls get element by ID quote demo, it's going to find the memory location of that tag and then it's going to replace this stuff with hello JavaScript and we're going to make a button that when called calls this function I could copy and paste that would be the fastest way of getting it to work I guess I'll try typing it in and then if it doesn't work I'll copy and paste it Just copy and paste it and it erases your whole thing. well let's go with this then yeah All right, so in my script, I'm going to be adding a function. Function change parentheses in parentheses. Next line, open curly brace. Next line, E equals, and this is all lowercase, document dot. And this next one's got some uppercase letters, E, B, and I for get element by ID are capitalized. Get, capital E, element, capital B, by, capital I, I, but lowercase d, parentheses, apostrophe demo, end apostrophe, end parentheses, semicolon. I don't know why they're not showing the semicolon. Guess it'll work without it, but I'm going to put them there. And then E dot, that's going to be the word enter, all lowercase, and then HTML in all caps. E dot, I-N-N-E-R, all lowercase, HTML in all caps, equals, not minus, equals, apostrophe, hello, JavaScript, exclamation mark, and apostrophe, semicolon. And on the next line, a close curly brace. 
So that's what our script looks like. It's just got one function tucked away in it. And if we wanted to do that business that was mentioned in an earlier slide, we'd put a little comment tag in front of it like that, but I'm not going to do that. Now down here, since that mouse over didn't work, I'm going to delete that mouse over bit and make it say ID equals single or double quote, it doesn't matter. I'll use double quote, demo in double quote. <coughs> Now this ID, you could have called it anything you wanted to, but you would have to make this match. So if you wanted to make this ID Fred, then when you get element by ID, you better make that Fred as well. So when I save it and run it, when I move my mouse over that paragraph of text, <coughs> no, when I click on it, no, I haven't added the click function yet. <coughs> we haven't added a button. So we're going to add a button underneath our text. Button, type equals button, on click equals change demo. All right, I think I can remember that well enough. Let's see if I can. So underneath the paragraph of text, angle, lowercase button, although it doesn't really matter, HTML will accept uppercase, but JavaScript is very picky. And I should not have closed my uh, close angle. I'm going to remove that. So it's angle, button, space, but no closing brace. Type equals quote button. Because you can have more than one button type. You can have like check boxes and, and the circular radio buttons and stuff like that. The next part of it is what happens when you click it. So it's going to say on click equals change or change demo if I use the exact text but since I made my function called change. So where was I? Here's my button. Type equals button on click with a capital C equals quote double click why not change parentheses in parentheses semicolon in double quote and they showed it spacing it out on several lines right they showed putting button on its own line and then the type on its own line <clears throat> then we're going to close the tag so after that quote here we're going to close it with a closing brace and the button needs some text so we know what to do with it click me please exclamation mark and then I need to close the button tag and you know how to do that less than slash button greater than now if I did it right when I click on click me please, it's going to look up that element by its, its ID and replace its inner HTML to hello JavaScript. So we have actually interacted with the document object model and changed something programmatically using JavaScript. We are now JavaScript programmers, so it's going to make it a lot of money. A little, little bit more involved than that, but that is a start. Now some of the programming classes 1113. I know when some of y'all took it, they didn't do any programming at all. And what other classes did is they used JavaScript. And to me, that would be really hard because if you make a syntax error, like what happens if you did, forgot a closing brace? Don't make this change because that's a syntax error. And then you run it, you don't know why it's not working. You don't get any error messages anywhere. So undo that. So that's programmatically changing via the miracle of get element by ID. If you had two things with the same ID, it would only change the first one. So you would want to give each one its own unique ID if you wanted to be able to change it. 
What if we wanted to be able to specify which ID based as a parameter here? And what do I mean by that? What if I wanted to be able to do this? Change parentheses apostrophe demo end apostrophe so that I could specify which, which paragraph it was going to change. Well, I would have to modify my script to accept a parameter there. I'm going to undo that for now, but we will hit that idea pretty soon. So to get this part to work, we would need to have some images. What is it going to do? When you click on a button, it's going to change. No, when you click on the image, it's going to change it to a different image. We could do that. But we have to go get two images. Now, I made the ID of this image droid because I assumed I was going to go and find two pictures of droids. But you can make it anything you want. Okay, so I'm going to go to Google search and look up R2D2 images. I'm going to find one. Right click on them. I should just be able to right click on them from here, huh? Do save image as. It's a WebP image. That doesn't help me much. Can I find one that's not? Save image as. JFIF. Can I just find a normal image? I just want a JPEG or a GIF. Okay, Google image search is starting to annoy me. Did I make them all some alternate format? Yes, they do nowadays. That's new. The one that says Amazon right there? Yeah. I think that's the JPEG. Open image and new tag. Okay. That's, yeah. Okay, so if I... I mean, it would work. Save image as... Well, whatever. So I'm going to call him droid1.jfif keeping the extension because otherwise it could break then I'm going to find a different picture I could make it a different droid or just a different view of the same one this one with all the arms sticking out right click save image as droid2.jfif and I need to put these in the same directory as my HTML file so if you're going to do this part of it make sure absolutely sure you've saved your images in that file excuse me in that folder all right now I have two pictures when clicked on they'll load up yay all right so I need to make an image that points to one of them. So over here, let's add a header. They suggest having a header here, so why not? H1 JavaScript can change images. Close H1. So less than H1 greater than JavaScript can change images less than slash h1 greater than so less than img space src equals quote droid1 dot jfif or whatever file name you chose if you found a jpeg or a gif or whatever go with it but there's more we need to give it a title so I'm going to say ID equals quote droid end quote and was there more still on click and a width 
I'm going to skip the on-click for now, just make sure it's displaying an image, because if I can't get it to display an image, I am out of luck. But I'm going to put the closing brace on the next line, the closing angle on the next line, just just because. I just want to see it load up and have my picture there. All right, there he is. Good deal. All righty, now we need to add the on click handler. On, capital C, click, equals, quote. Let's see what he was supposed to call. We're going to write a method called change image, which is going to a lot like the other one. So on click equals change, capital I, image, parentheses, in parentheses, semicolon, end quote. And then they had a height or width specification. I'm going to leave that off for now because I can. And so when I click on him, he's supposed to call that function, but I haven't written that function yet, so he's not doing anything. And I'm not getting any errors either. You can see why debugging this can be a real pain. All right. So I'm going to go and add another script called change image. So under the closing curly brace of the function, function space change capital I image just to match what we had down here. I'm going to get rid of this comment here because it's blocking up my view of the code. All right. Change image parentheses in parentheses. Open curly brace, close curly brace. And again, we need to do this E equals document dot get element by ID. If you have that working, why not just copy it? But change that from demo to whatever the ID of your picture was. My ID was droid. So I'm going to change this ID up here to match. Now they make it so that each time you click on it, it will toggle between two pictures. That's great and all that, but let's just make it change once so that we don't have to put an if statement. Make it simpler. So how's it going to change the image? Image.src equals image2. Now where'd that src come from? Is that magical? Well, check it out. Image space src. So it's just changing this attribute of this object. So after we get it, we're going to say, my short term memory, to me that doesn't look like it's going to work. Oh, I see. I called it E in my example, and it's called image here. I better follow the example real closely. So instead of making it an E, I'm going to call this image. And then image.src is equal to the uh, name of the other file. Now my first file was called droid1.jfif. When I did it, you may have gotten something different. So I need to make this one quote droid2.jfif, end quote, semicolon. some possibility this is actually going to even work. Let's run it and find out. So I clicked on it and it displayed a broken link. Meaning I got the file name wrong. That's the most likely error. Let's go look. Where are my images? Okay, fine. Sort by name. Droid2.jfif, droid1.jfif. Oh, anybody see the mistake? I forgot my two there. That'll work. So I click on the picture and it changes. The last thing that was on the 
PowerPoint here that I did not type in was a width specifier for the image to force it to be of the same width. Or I could do a height specifier, like if I wanted it to be 600 pixels tall. PS, I'm not sure about that. So anyways, let's do that. For our image tag, after the quote, I'm going to do height equals quote 800 end quote or 800 px end quote. That's a little bit too large. And PS made him look way larger than what he's supposed to look like. I'm going to change that to P. I'm going to remove that altogether. Let's see what it looks like now. Am I just zoomed in a lot? Why is he so big? Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make this style equals quote height colon 800 end quote well maybe that really is 800 pixels I guess it is because my screen is 1024 by 800 so yeah I'm gonna change that to 400 you don't need to be so big and I should be putting semicolons after all of my all of my properties inside the style tag excuse me inside the style attribute Alright, that's better. I click on him and it makes something else the same size. And if we had done all of the code that the slide demonstrated, then it would be swapping back and forth. So if you feel like doing that, if you feel like putting the if statement in here that the this shows you, feel free. You can figure out what it's doing. Alright, say Going on to the next step, we can pop up a dialog. It's called a confirmation dialog. So this function is going to be called say OK. So let's type it in first. And we can see that it creates a variable called x and it calls the confirm function. And if they click yes, then it's supposed to say yay else it's supposed to say uh-oh and then pop up an alert. Then we're going to create a button that when it's clicked it's going to do that. Well, let's do that. Let's see if we can get that going. Not via the Python shell though. Alright, so in my scripts, this is going to be another script. So function space say Caps, OK, close open parentheses, close parentheses, curly brace, VAR space X equals confirm, the whole word confirm, quote, or parentheses, quote, confirm, question mark, end quote, in parentheses, semicolon. They're just going by the rule that if the line ends, then there's an automatic implied semicolon there, and I don't agree with that. So, And then if they click yes, then x that they store the result in is going to be true. So if x, whoops, but we've got to put it in parentheses in this language, unlike, Java, unlike Python. So if parentheses x equals equals true in parentheses, hit enter tab over, txt equals quote yay, end quote, next line, else, next line, txt equals quote uh oh, end quote. And the last thing we got to do is the alert message, which is right there. Whoops, come back. So after the if else alert parentheses text in parentheses, and I'm going to go back and add semicolons where they belong, which is right here, right here. 
and right here, but not on the if or the else. And then we need a closing brace. So this is what this function looks like right now. Now we already have an on-click handler that called change. I'm just going to change it to call say OK instead. So if you go down to your on-click handler for the button that does change parentheses in parentheses, button type equals button, on-click equals change. Make it say button type equals button, on click equals say, and then in caps, OK, parentheses in parentheses. And so when I click, click me please, confirm, OK, or cancel. If I click OK, it says yay. If I click it and I click cancel, it says uh oh. All right, that's the last thing we're going to do to it, so I'm going to make the Dropbox. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have brought that over to you. Thank you. Sure. All right, so for those of y'all working on it and done, you can give me the HTML file there.